Hey, and welcome to Matt and Jess TV. I am Matt Roast here with Jessica Bun Bun. This is our reaction and review for Feud Capote versus the Swans, episode three, the black and white ball. Good news, everybody. You are all our guests of honor. We are not oh. going to make anybody fight. We're not going to have any passive aggressiveness going on here. This is a a big, fun, inclusive party. Nobody's getting thrown out. We're all, we're all just here and we're happy. Nobody's getting cut from the list. We're all here together. This episode was 10 out of 10. I absolutely love this episode. When they started this episode like straight in black and white, I was like, this is going to be fire. I really loved it too. And I, I will admit, I had like a tiny amount of concern going into it because I, I thought the first two episodes <laughs> were very good, mm -hmm. but I thought that there was a little bit of a flaw in how there was kind of a lot of movement around through time. Yes. And they also weren't exactly explaining all that often when they were moving around through time. So yes. I think it got a little bit more confusing than it needed to be. But here, like, I don't mind that we're fully in the past. Like, I'm fine with it. But you set up and established well that we were fully in the past and that this episode was going to be about this big gathering and this documentary that was being made about it. Mm -hmm. But that even in itself, like the way that they sort of evolve from there as to how Capote eventually decides that he's going to turn all this into answered prayers, mm -hmm. it kind of actually makes the form of the documentary work. It makes it so that it's not just like some sort of like cheap <laughs> device where it's just like, okay, this is our office style mockumentary episode it's like okay there's actually meaning to this yeah it also just is nice to be with capote during like the height of everything that was going on for him you know in cold blood it was a big success this was the first time that he really had his own money to be able to do something this extravagant like it was really like him at his top yeah, there's a real interesting sense of, I don't know if we want to call it like cognitive dissonance, but just like there's a real sense of strangeness to the idea that this is, like you said, <laughs> Capote at the peak of his powers in 1966, coming off this huge success of a book. But this book is basically about a family getting murdered mm -hmm. in their home in Kansas. And yet it's such dark subject matter. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody's talking about like the psychological <laughs> after effects of all of it. It's just there's such a people still aren't these days. Yeah, it's just there's just such an interesting hollowness to all of this where it is like Capote is coming off this just like really harrowing experience, you know, like mm -hmm. as a casual Capote fan, I kind of feel like what he went through writing in Cold Blood is one of the reasons why he didn't write more books afterwards. And yet here we are with lavishness, with, you know, over-the-top ridiculousness, with costumes, <laughs> with wealth. It's just such a fascinating dichotomy that sort of shows who this guy is and what this guy is using to try to cover up some of his pain. And this is still continuing on with sort of this theme where it's like, does riches equal that you can't have feelings or you can't have, you know, human connections? And we're going to sort of dive a little more into that, too, because as much as there's like, oh, I have 15 houses and I'm, you know, yeah. swimming in my jewelry or whatever. People need people. It just doesn't matter how rich you are or not rich you are. Human connection is what life is all about. Mm -hmm. And there's a different set of like circumstances that are there for people who are famous or wealthy of making those human connections that can make it a lot more difficult that I think people don't ever really talk about. Art doesn't talk about it that much because of course there's a lot of yeah. people out there like, Oh, you know, go cry in your jewelry, just, you know, buy another house. That'll make you feel better. But it doesn't because life is about human connections. And when you're in that state where you're, rich or you're you know you have status people want things from you so it's kind of like we see these women where it's like okay they have wealth but they don't have connections and it's even more apparent in this episode how Capote uses that to his advantage to use these women to get what he wants well we will break all of that down further but first be sure to hit that subscribe button. You know, we're still in the early going here of Capote versus the Swans. We have a lot more in the way of videos coming up. We don't want you guys to miss that. And by subscribing, you help to support us to be able to continue to make these videos for you guys. Okay, let's talk about Lee, who's somebody who actually hasn't been 
that much in yeah. this show. But for me, the scene that was the most, one of the most powerful in this episode was her confessional about Capote that like just nailed exactly what he's doing because Capote has admitted in private that this is what he's doing. And Lee sees him exactly for what he's doing. We even see it at the end where he's kind of watching that confessional. He's watching what happened with Anne and he's watching those two scenes over and over and over again and just getting really like, wow, you know, for, for all the extravagance and mm -hmm. all the fun that everybody had, this person really actually sees what I'm doing and I feel really exposed. And she's talking about what I was just talking about, which is the idea that if you're really rich and really famous, there's a loneliness that comes with it. Because, and I mean, I think we've all heard people talk about this. People don't talk about it too often, but I've heard different celebrities and people who have wealth talk about this. The idea is just like, you can't trust anybody. People want things from you if they're having a relationship with you. And even if they're not, it's because so many people want your money. They want your status. They want something from you. They want to climb the ladder, whatever it is, that that's happened to you so many times that you're just kind of like, well, then there's nobody. Like, even when somebody's genuine, you're just looking at them with a yeah. side eye being like, well, what is it you want from me? Because you don't actually want me. Where some of like, the rest of us who are just like, you know, normal people that don't have wealth. I mean, like, you know, we're YouTubing from a room in my house. Like, you know, <laughs> we're not wealthy. We're not famous. So we don't have that. But the, the rest of us yeah. who are just kind of normal people, we don't have to deal with that in that same way. Of course, people are going to hurt us and betray us. But typically more so we can make human connections a little bit easier because people aren't there to be like, what can you give me? Can you give me status? Can you give me money? Yeah. I think it's a very interesting idea that this show is sort of breaching upon, which is this relationship between money and <laughs> happiness. And like Capote is the ultimate epitome of all of this to me, because this is a guy it's really ironic that this is a big masquerade because Capote's always wearing a mask. Like I yep. think he is, incapable in some ways of being really vulnerable because he's afraid of being cracked wide open. I think he's really afraid of asking a lot of questions about himself, including, you know, these ideas of why can he not relate to certain people in his life? And yet, why was he able to relate to some of the killers and in cold blood or questions about, you know, his upbringing, some of the things that he's gone through. And I think for him, he wants to stay busy. He wants to have something kind of constantly going. He wants to have people all around him. He wants people to tell him how great he is. Like, that's the key, I think, to his ultimate happiness. And then, you know, kind of inversely, by him sort of working and sort of dealing with all these different women, he's providing them with something that he knows that they need. And then they can then give him something that he needs. I think he sees this as sort of this interesting, like symbiotic relationship, but it's, it's not exactly like he thinks it is, but that's sort of Capote in a nutshell. Yeah, that's the thing about it is that, yes, he's like he's preying on their loneliness mm. so that he can get what he wants as well, which is status and to move around that society. Lee called that out in the documentary and was just yeah. kind of like, you know, if he just got cut off from it, from us, like he would crumble and which is what's happening in the present on this show. He's been cut off by Lee's suggestion. <laughs> Here we are years later, you know, and she's like, no, he's done. He did this to us. We're doing this to him. I know what would what would just crush him sort of thing. And, you know, I think that that's why the most interesting character to me is Babe. Like when we first saw this whole show sort of opening up with her and what was going on with her husband and this affair and how like just hurtful and destructive it was to her because she is somebody who has nobody. She has Capote, but he has his own agenda too. When they first met up after everything that happened, her whole reaction to it was tears. She's hurt and divorce. And I think that the word divorce was really important in that scene because he was working it to make sure she stayed married, stayed in the status and stayed with the money. She didn't say anything about any of those things. She had made a decision. She was like, 
I'm done. My heart is broken. And he came in and sort of smoothed it out being like, oh, it's not your heart. You don't really love him. You just, you know, they'll be fine. You know, get him to buy you this and buy you that. And he like finessed her into a way of thinking that she wasn't thinking. She was ready to go. Like she didn't care about it anymore. So him sort of piling on to like, oh, you can still get this and that, whatever. You know, you don't want to be by yourself. You don't want this, whatever that her feelings about this situation were just glossed over by him. Yeah. So it made it easier for him to then put that out there to be like, yeah, she does agree with me because he's, she's so influenced by him that she just did end up agreeing. She's like, okay, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe I don't love him. Maybe it is just my bruised ego. Okay. Yeah. You know, maybe that part of my relationship is done. Yep. You're right. Let me give you a hug. You know, like that's how their relationship works. It's also just a situation here where, you know, months after the fact that I'm speaking hypothetically here in sort of a general sense, as opposed to anything with babe in particular. But if she went to Truman months in advance and was just like, you convinced me to stay, you did this, you did, he'll just be like, you make your own decisions. I was just here. I, he would take no ownership of it no. whatsoever. Like he is so like skilled at being controlling in that way. And it, you know, it, it is messed up, but it's also interesting to watch. The, the charisma that he has and the way that he was able to tell each of the swans that they're going to be the guest of honor and <laughs> yeah. then like pick somebody that we haven't even seen on the show yet. Yeah. And it's just like, it's so interesting to watch like him at his height, sort of be able to get in and out of things, you know, inviting, you know, Slim's ex-husband's wife who took her husband and, and be able to actually smooth that over and have her be able to come and have all of them be like, I didn't want to be the guest of honor anyways. It was all fine. Like it was so fascinating to watch how he was able to like give them that little bit of hope, everything that was going on with CZ and all her things were that were getting, you know, repossessed. And he's like, don't worry, you know, you'll be, you'll be my guest of honor sort of thing. And she's just that loneliness again, right? She's by herself in her house. These things are happening to her. She has nobody, but here's Capote here to swoop in white knight. I'm here for you. I'm going to make you feel special. Don't worry. That was my favorite part of the episode. Like that whole storyline was, it was true to the show. It was also funny and a little bit over the top <laughs> at times. It's very indicative of who he is. And like my quote unquote knowledge of Capote has been mostly limited to like the end cold blood era. Like I knew a little bit going into this show as to what happened after I did. I didn't know a lot. And so I didn't know who the guest of honor was going to be. I didn't know how the storyline was going to end. Like there was a part of me through this entire thing that he, I kind of thought at one point he was going to stand up and be like, the guest of honor is me. And he was <laughs> just going to make it himself. And then that was going to be this like whole to do, but this is more, it's more effective that he picks somebody, Catherine Graham, who may not even be like that close a friend or whatever, but I think it's clearly somebody who he feels like he can get something from down the road. And I think this disappointment is all transactional. It is this idea of, I will elevate your status in my world, these hundreds of people, but then, you know, Maybe if I need something from you down the road, I publish another book, I need something smoothed over, you you will be there for me because I made you special. Yeah, I think it was really interesting when they were asking him while she was beside him, you know, why did you pick Catherine for this? And he's like, she has a really good story and she's so brave for her story of this horrible thing that's yeah. happened to her. And I was like, oh, okay. So he's probably... One, using her for that story that eventually down the line, he probably thought, ah, I'll, I'll dive in more to the story, make her feel special, get more details about this story, write another book and it'll be her story. And then I'll just sort of discard her. But I think the other reason he decided to pick her is because as he was picking the swans, I think he realized there was no way he was going to be able to pick one of them and keep all of them. He had to never pick any of them. Yeah, he, he painted himself into a corner here. Like, he was able to find a way out. And, you know, I guess good for you on that, Truman. But, you know, you still created a whole mess of things <laughs> in a bunch of other ways. Because, like, the real, I think, seminal moment of this episode, the thing that's the most striking is what happens ultimately to Ann Woodward, who decides to show up 
to this party without being on the list mm -hmm. with her son in this big effort to try to get like a certain element of, you know, social credibility back and hope that it's going to work out because there are other people who are at this who are not on the list. So it, it, it's all got to be okay, right? Yeah, having Capote be like, yeah, there's other people on this list, but I like them. I mean, it was so just cruel and her sort of at that end point, like really begging him and just being like, listen, like yeah. again, with the loneliness and the isolation that comes from, you know, being an outcast, having money, having status, all those types of things in that world that she's just like, you know, there, there is this loneliness about her. It's affecting her son as well. She wants to make sure that her son doesn't go through this. And eventually Capote's kind of like, kind of like, okay, the son can stay, but you have to go. Yeah, it's, it's so dark, but it's also so indicative again of like who this guy really is and how he's going to sort of play around with things. The funniest thing while I was watching it, because, you know, once again, I don't have that big a knowledge about this particular point, is that I was sort of being like, okay, well, if he's making this documentary and here he is like berating <laughs> Anne in the middle of it, why does he even need to write the book like why why is the book even a last straw here and you know as it turns out through this entire experience truman realizes ah it'll be better as a book anyway so he's also just effectively wasted all these documentarians time putting all this together it's true but i mean it seems like he was behind the documentary so if he's funding it you know does it matter not to him he doesn't care about anybody else's time it's not about that for him for him it's about money it's about status and it feels like for a lot of the swans not all the swans but a lot of the swans it's about you have that these riches and that status but it's actually not fulfilling because you can't make any human connections and then in comes capote to be like i'll be that human connection for you i got you but i don't this is where we get to the quote and this is th this quote is amazing i first heard it you know years ago when I, I first saw the philip seymour hoffman capote i think when i was like in my early 20s or something like that and i, and I loved that movie but there's a quote that's at the end of it, it says more tears are shed over answered prayers than unanswered ones and at the time i didn't really get it i was just kind of like okay what's what does this have to do with anything? Because, you know, it's a reference to this book that Truman's putting together. It's not a reference to In Cold Blood, but, you know, you sort of pair that with this episode. And all of a sudden, like, my mind is completely blown. It's like, I finally, I finally get it, everybody, where it's like these women have had their dreams come true in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. They have found success. They have found money. And yet now they have this thing that they have been wanting and it's not giving them anything that they actually thought it would. And it's just leaving them in this like devastated place. If your prayers aren't answered, you don't know what that feeling is like. You don't know what that helplessness is like. And I think it's just such a one, it's such a wonderful quote. And it's like, I understand now why Capote wanted to name that book that. And it's just like, it's a shame you never really got around to actually finishing it, Truman. I mean, granted, you could have done it without, like, you know, ruining your entire friend's lives. Yeah, that's that's the thing about it, right? Like, I mean, this was back in a time where, you know, there wasn't social media. Like, that yeah. could have... I mean, we even saw the effects back then of just writing about it. Anne is dead after yeah. all of this, that he's been spreading this rumors, gossip. Nobody knows if it's true or not. It doesn't even matter. It's ruined her to the point that when it's finally out there, she can't handle it anymore. Like, And that is something that is very relatable to what is going on today with people that are doing that online. And the same sort of things are happening. People can't handle it and they're gone or people can't handle it. They disappear off social media. They're closed down. They, they stop having human connections. And I think it's just some of the swans made that type of connection with him. CZ did. And I think that that mm -hmm. moment she was going through everything, you know, losing her stuff, everything, getting seized. And he was really there for her and nobody else was, is the reason why she has more compassion for him during the more the present where it's like, okay, yes, he did these things, but what, what we're planning to do or what we're doing to him does not fit the crime of what he did because of 
we have to keep into consideration what he has done for us, which is lifted a loneliness, gave us a, a place to go and, you know, cry, smile, be ourselves, be human, not just be rich and famous, but actually just be a person. Whether, you know, he meant it or not, it feels like he there's a part of him that did and she mm -hmm. wants to believe that. Yeah, I, I think there is I think there is that part of him, and can, you know, and Truman's also capable of being vulnerable, of being helpful. Like there is an interesting amount of depth to him. And it's like, there's two more things that really interest me about this episode. Like one of them is of course, seeing Jessica Lang again. And my initial reaction to all of this is just like, <laughs> Ryan Murphy, your entire production team, like how are you able to convince, you know, living legend Jessica Lang to do so many of your shows, especially this one where you're basically just like, okay, you're not going to be in the key art. You're not really going to be hyped that much. Your casting is going to come out shortly before it premieres. I'm just going to use you for like a few minutes in certain episodes. But when she shows up, yeah. it's like the real unlocking of Truman. It's just sort of like, okay, this is one of the few relationships that I think he has an element of vulnerability towards. Like, you know, even on the occasions when she's not even actually there, it's just still like we get like this different side of him. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he even sort of brought that up with Anne as well, where she was like, you told me you, you know, I, I remind you of your mom. And he's just like, yeah, you do. Which I think is why later we see him rewatching that scene where he's having this with her. It's like, if she reminds him of his mom, is he acting this way because of, you know, unresolved feelings with his mom and what is going on? Or is he acting that way because he got what he wants and now he's done? One last thing here. Can we get more slim? Can I just say that? I love Diane Lane. You, you have her in the key art. This is sort of just like with Lee. You mentioned earlier. All these swans got equal billing on the key. It's like... Mm -hmm. There are multiple of them we've only seen like tiny glimpses of, and I'm sure it will change over time. I'm sure Slim will have her moments. We've seen a little bit of Molly Ringwald, but you know, mm -hmm. not really a priority in this episode. It's just like, I, I love this cast. I want more of this cast, but I also can't be greedy because this is like well over an hour with commercials and it was so well done. Yeah. I feel like we're going to get more of those characters. I think they're kind of doing like, you know, we're getting more of Babe at the beginning. We got way more of CZ in this one than we have before. You know, as we're going on, I feel like we're going to get more and more of them. All right. Well, we have to close down the ball now, everybody. I'm oh. sorry. But you know what? Rest assured, we will be back with more of Capote and this versus the Swans through the rest of this show. So be sure to hit that subscribe button so you guys don't miss that. Also, you can click on that card right there if you want to see our take on the first two episodes. Mm -hmm. Also, be sure to join our Patreon for more exclusive content. We have a link in the description below. And thank you to our patrons you. for your support. We'll see you guys here next time.